Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. I'm Glenn Bottomley, and today my guest is Jessica Myers, Marketing Operations and Technology Director at PatientPop, recently merged with Cario, a combined organization that offers healthcare providers capabilities that enhance every step of the patient journey and digital connections, which benefit both practice and patient. Thanks for joining me today, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me, Glenn. Well, to get started, let's first talk about a fascinating fun fact <laughs> about you. I know that you are active in a variety of marketing operations communities. And a while back, I remember you telling me that you started a video series called Moops, <laughs> which is a fun play on words between marketing and oops, referring to specific marketing mistakes. And you share fun and enlightening stories of, you know, mistakes that marketing operations professionals have made in the past, what they've learned from them, et cetera. So tell us a little bit more about why did you start that mm -hmm. and why do you think it's important to talk about marketing mistakes? Uh, great question. I actually think the origin story of that podcast series is super fun. So as you mentioned, I'm active in a handful of communities in the space. Um, and in one of those communities, there was a Slack post where the founder of the community was sharing uh, an update in the general Slack. And I noticed that he mistyped a link. Uh, so the link was broken. And I sent him a quick note, said, hey, I uh, noticed that you posted this update and the link is broken. And he responded with moops. Um, we then got to chatting about how we'd both been wanting to put out content around learning from mistakes in the marketing space. And one thing led to another and the video series was born. Um, before that, during my life as a consultant, I was really, really big with our team on learning from mistakes. I think that in the marketing space, mistakes can feel really visual and or visceral and guttural because you send out an email with a broken link and oh no, a hundred thousand people got my email. Um, but there's so much learning to be had from those mistakes and so much insight to be gained. I think listening to other seasoned pros share their mistakes is one calming and reassuring to those of us who make mistakes and um, a really good learning opportunity for new people to the community uh, to take away insight and process changes in their own day to day to make them a better uh, ops professional. I love that. I think that is so wonderful because everybody makes mistakes. And I think some of the best learnings that you can have, uh, you know, can come from those, uh, those experiences that where you go, oh, shoot, that, that wasn't quite <laughs> right. You know, because it's, you know, it's that avoidance of pain. I don't want to go through that again. And uh, so I think that's wonderful that you've done that. And uh, I think that's uh, uh, just such a, a, a great service. So uh, thank you for that. I think that's wonderful. I know I personally have implemented a, a number of my own process changes to my own workflow as a result of mistakes I have made. And I think hopefully people sharing those things they've learned themselves uh, makes it so that future people in the space maybe don't have to make the same mistake and can start with just the learning that somebody else is sharing with them. Yeah, exactly. It's that stair step you're building on the shoulders of those who came before. So uh, I, I think that's uh, that's wonderful. Now, um, so now your current firm, Patient Pop, uh, as as we discussed, has merged with Cario, and the new organization name is going to be called Tebra. Now, you've mentioned that both organizations had really different MarTech stacks, and that right now you're essentially managing two different MarTech stacks, and you're kind of working to sort of combine them into one sort of super powerful MarTech stack. So I'm certain that this is uh, likely presenting you with some uh, unexpected challenges, uh, shall we say? So can you describe uh, for us a little bit about what are some of those challenges uh, and how are you sort of focused on addressing them? I love the framing of this question. Um, as you alluded to, you know, with two companies coming together that are both quite large, we had uh, a number of competing and overlapping technologies supporting our go-to-market org um, and specifically, obviously, marketing. I think one of the 
challenges that I was aware of, but maybe not prepared for the complexity is actually the challenge of aligning on process um, and aligning the people across the two orgs. In addition to having a robust suite of go-to-market technologies supporting, supporting both orgs, both orgs also just function and operate a little differently in terms of how they track things through their funnel, how they um, attribute revenue to various programs and channels, how they uh, how their marketing team measures successes and progress towards goal um, from a high level standpoint. And then kind of into the nitty gritty of like data, the data processes across the two are very, very different um, and how we capture and group our data. And the tech that supports an org of the size of both Patient Pop and Karyo is really only as powerful as the process and the adherence to that process. And so while we're focused on aligning the tech, we're also going through a really big process rationalization exercise. And that I knew was going to be complex, but I think it's like an onion and each layer you peel off kind of presents some new challenges that maybe you weren't thinking about when you started peeling apart that onion. Yeah. Well, and let's take that analogy one step further about the onion, because I think it's a good one. And that is, so obviously, if you take that analogy, uh, there's an outside layer and then there's a layer underneath and a layer underneath and a layer underneath. So when you're looking at that, how are you deciding or not, or how do you decide or rec recommendations you can make as to which one becomes the outer layer? Like, what do you tackle first? What do you tackle second? Uh, and so forth. Because I think that to your point, process, I mean, technology used effectively helps to make process more efficient, uh, more effective, et cetera. And so I think this um, observation that you've made about that the processes of the two organizations are so different. And so having to really start there in understanding what are we trying to achieve as an organization and recognizing those differences, then apply the technology to it. But in this case, all of that work had already been done in two different teams, two different sets of stacks. Uh, so how are you thinking about, like, what do you tackle first? <laughs> Great question. Um, so I think my very first, the very first thing we started to tackle was, you know, inventory, if you will. Um, inventory rationalization across the two, across the companies, as far as technology. Um, pretty high level, you know, what is the piece of technology? Generally, some important things as far as like contracting and subscriptions. And then a high level understanding of how the technology is being used across the two teams. We are in the next phase of that at this point. So starting to take that a bit deeper and really digging into, and I say digging in, but we're still only going about a hundred, you know, 10 inches deep, <laughs> but digging in a little bit more on what exactly the process flow looks like. So walking through um, what does lead creation from the website all the way through to passing to the sales team look like? What are the important milestones? What are the important data fields? Really starting to build a process map so we can call out and understand some of those differences. And then working across the org to understand what we want our go forward to look like, because there's certainly going to be situations where, and there have been, where one team really likes their tool or process, and it's an easy decision to merge into that. And then there's certain situations where we're encountering, hey, maybe for the benefit of the combined go forward org, we should evaluate if either of these are serving the purpose of the org and what it should look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that there's a, a word you used earlier when you were talking about inventory and you said inventory rationalization. And a lot of what I also heard you describe in your answer there was a sense of rationalization across the business. 
um, you know, looking at and coming to agreement on uh, what's the role of marketing operations going to be moving forward? How do we rationalize lead generation? How are we rationalizing uh, sending leads directly to sales? Uh, how are we managing inventory? So what I'm sensing from you is, is, is that there's a real observation over the value chain really from start to finish in this now new world of the, not just to, to MarTech stacks coming together, but to organizations coming together. And so that feels like a really deep and rich exercise that you're going through that not only I would imagine is very um, exciting, empowering, um, energizing, but likely, you know, also a bit frustrating at times and confusing at times and, naturally there's going to be, it's like two planets coming together. You know, there's going to naturally be friction uh, with this, with this happening. So um, that's the part that kind of hits me as you're describing it is, is, is that you're really kind of going back to not only are we merging these stacks, but we're merging the organizations and what do we want to be like, you know, five years from now? Yes. I think we've thought a lot about what, you know, combined values of the org will be and, and how the technology and, process we're building for our team, but also for our prospects and our customers really support the values of what we want the org to, to be in the future. And, you know, beyond that, I think there's some really important business questions to answer. What are core metrics? How do we want to be able to gain insight and understanding as a business that we have to get, that we are working to get insight into because how we build the technology stack to support that really is dependent on understanding what we want things to look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I could definitely see that. Now, here, here's a here's a question related to sort of how you're merging these together. On one hand, I could hear I could think of this as well: two organizations coming together, two Martech stacks coming together. It, two plus two should equal five, meaning <laughs> we're going to, we're going to merge these groups together and we're going to get more out of it, you know, in the long run, hence two plus two equals five. But I could also envision here with redundancy of an organization, maybe redundancy of tools, overlapping tools, et cetera, that could two and two actually equal three, <laughs> meaning it's actually smaller, but far more effective, far more efficient because now you can get from point A to point B quicker, i.e. the three. Um, so are you sort of looking at it from that perspective that maybe there may be some process steps along the way that we would actually be more efficient by eliminating MarTech stack technology or changing process to become more efficient? Is that part of the equation here too? I think that's certainly part of the equation. One thing the team supporting this is really paying close attention to is, are there th processes or technologies that exist in the current suite today that maybe aren't serving the end state or end goal of the org? Or are there processes or technologies that are getting 90% of the way to the end state or end goal that we have the opportunity as a part of this large merger and rationalization process to potentially change how that functions in the scope of the entire org. And I think that's what makes this process really exciting and, and also really challenging is yeah. that there is some of two plus two equals five, and yeah. there's some of two plus two equals three. Yeah. Um, and there's probably some additional equations in the mix that I haven't yet encountered or thought we of. We don't have the calculus for yet, right. <laughs> but there's certainly situations where we're going to be really adding to and getting additional benefit out of the merger. And there's certainly situations where we have the opportunity to be a little leaner and really think about the best way for that piece of technology or process to exist in the org. Um, as we bring the two together. Yeah, well said, well said. So uh, let's shift now a little bit to the lead to sales process. So throughout all of the time that you've worked in, uh, in marketing operations, what have been some of the transferable lessons 
that you've learned about the lead to sale processes and, and, and what uh, mistakes or moops uh, have, <laughs> have you made uh, or learned from that uh, you could share with our audience? Oh, um, I think the biggest transferable lesson is some degree of the old adage kiss um, or for lack of a better term, keep it simple. Um, and I'm going to not say the last S, but you guys all know where I'm going with this one. Um, I think I have, I, I've encountered a number of uh, situations where the marketing to sales process gets overly complicated. Um, at the end of the day, the goal of the handoff is to find and identify qualified potential customers share them with our sales team and give our sales team the information they need to have an effective conversation with that prospect um, to, you know, see if we are the right solution for them. I think it is easy sometimes to think that the latest and greatest piece of technology or latest and greatest addition to that handoff process is going to fix any problems you may be having in handing off leads to your sales team. But if you go back to what is the root goal is find and identify qualified potential customers and make sure that the sales team knows what they need to, if those core objectives aren't being met, doesn't matter what piece of technology you layer onto the equation, it isn't going to solve the problem. And so really, really focusing on the foundational building blocks of that handoff and making sure, you know, the foundation is earthquake proof before you start to layer on the bells and whistles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, salient advice because, you know, the, if you, if you build something on sand, you know, it's, it's gonna, it's obviously going to crumble. It's not going to be solid, et cetera. So focus on the foundations, focus on the, the, the basics, so to speak, the blocking and tackling. And then once you've locked that down, then move forward and, and, you know, add the next layer, add the next layer. Uh, so yeah, I think there's so many incredible tools out there that can really make that that process super efficient and provide a ton of insight to the SEALs team. And I think there are some really fantastic players in that space right now. But if you have fundamental misalignment uh, at the beginning of the process on, you know, what is a qualified prospect? Um, when does the sales team want to be looped into the conversation? What amount of information do they need in order to have a productive conversation? Um, you're going to struggle with, you know, everything else mm -hmm. after that, yeah. after that handoff. I could definitely see that. Yeah. Now for, uh, think about uh, our audience, uh, marketing operations professionals, um, you're involved in a whole number of, uh, you know, marketing operations, communities, et cetera. So uh, for someone new uh, to marketing operations, what would be some learning communities that you would promote to them and, uh, and why have you found them to be so useful? I... I am a huge advocate for a number of the communities out in the space. And I think there are so many fantastic ones that I struggle to, you know, pick a couple of favorites. I think the best communities um, out there are going to be the ones where you get the most value. Um, you being the person joining the community. I think I am partial to a handful of Slack communities myself because that's, you know, where I spend my day to day. Um, after functioning for a number of years as a consultant before moving in-house. When I moved in-house, I was a team of one. Um, and one of the things I missed the most was a group of people who were in the systems I was in all day, every day to just, you know, sanity check or bounce ideas off of. And I think though the number of Slack communities um, that have sprung up in the last couple of years really fill that need for smaller teams because most ops teams are relatively small. Um, the other place I'll plug is a number of the, the big players in the technology space. I'm thinking most of the automation uh, players have their own equivalent of a community um, forum, what have you, where there's great and abundant information relevant to that specific piece of technology. And I think those are also a really good learning 
resource. I know I've gotten a number of answers from the communities of a handful of the specific technologies that I use. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. And it's helpful. I think and a lot of it is a trial and error as well. Uh, go out, try, listen, uh, take what you can, uh, find the value that you need uh, or that you're looking for. And, uh, and if you're getting the value, continue. If not, uh, you know, move on. So, I mean, I think that that's I've, good. I've joined and engaged in a number and there are I think a handful that are really good for specific pieces of technology or specific subsets. Um, there's a couple dedicated to, you know, women in the operation space and things like that now that I think they all serve a really unique purpose and kind of the best community out there is the one that energizes you, that you, you know, find a sense of community in and find like-minded people who are happy to, you know, answer your question and you want to answer their questions mm -hmm. um, and kind of which one is best, I think depends a little bit about on the technology use, technologies you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yeah. Make it applicable. Um, now I know that you started earlier, um, you know, in your career, you were a consultant, uh, but now you're leading your own team uh, of marketing operations professionals. So how have you found marketing operations to has to have changed since moving from a consultant to now leading your own team? Um, this is another good question that I thought a lot about. Uh, when I was a consultant, I was definitely a little bit more focused on, you know, the core um, automation platform. So, uh, you know, big MAP and obviously CRM aspects of that. I think one thing that is really important when you move in-house is, you know, your marketing automation and your CRM are still going to be probably the hub and the two hubs of your go-to-market technology stack or your marketing technology stack. But one thing about being in-house that's a little different is you get the opportunity to plug into, I think, a lot of different players that's really exciting. Um, I also think one thing I've really, I think is a really interesting challenge about being in-house is the work is a much longer roadmap, <laughs> if you will. Um, when you're a consultant, it's really important to prioritize for your clients. And I think being in-house, I've done a lot of, well, I want to fix this, but it's mostly working or it's working well enough. And these are the things that I need to prioritize in the really, really short term and think about where that can fit into a longer roadmap. Yeah. Because to your point, uh, being a consultant, sometimes your work is, is time bound. Uh, you've got this project that has to get done from this point to that point, uh, and then wrap it up, finish it up, et cetera. But to your point now there does, I mean, it may, your work today with working with the team may be time bound, but by other factors, uh, industry factors, uh, you know, market factors, uh, upcoming trade show, who knows what. Um, so I could, I can, um, understand and respect what you're saying about the difference, uh, from the, from the time perspective, but also sort of the scope of, uh, of activity. Uh, as well. I think consultants also often are brought in as the industry expert. And when you bring in a consultant, they often get the luxury of uh, uh, really going through things with a fine tooth comb and proposing a pretty extensive roadmap for rationalization to what the like perfect end state would be. Um, but a lot of times as an in-house resource, it's balancing that with all of the things you mentioned, you know, the trade show we've got going on or the new um, vendor that needs to be onboarded into your tech stack that is solving a, a paid lead, you know, integration or things like that. It is supporting regular email campaigns. It is uh, working on a nurture program. It's all of the day-to-day -day stuff in addition to some of those longer term projects. Um, so it's a little bit of a balance of those two aspects in an in-house role. Well said. Now, uh, so yeah. here's, I'm going to have two questions for you and there it's literally the flip side of the same coin. So the first question is, so what aspect of marketing operations is absolutely energizing you the most right now? Uh, you know, is it a, a specific new technology, maybe some new trend, um, a new integration, some uh, process enhancement, something. So what 
what's absolutely energizing you the most about marketing operations right now? <laughs> um, I think the kind of subset of technologies that I'm finding the most energizing and really interesting and fascinating are the subset of like IPaaS or ETLs. So like integrators that also do data transformation um, and data governance um, or integrate things that maybe previously you needed a developer to custom code an application that would sit in the middle. And I think there's a number of really cool technologies in this space that allow you to do really incredible things with your data from a transformation and a matching standpoint that previously were really, really challenging. Um, that space, I'm definitely finding the most interest and in all of these cool ideas of ways that I think that could be deployed. Um, and that's a space that I think has grown a lot in the last two years um, and is starting to become a more fundamental element of a lot of people's tech stacks. Um, that were was not something people really did even three or four years ago, or not as much, not as mainstream. Mm -hmm. And is it is the appeal of that uh, to you? It, could you distill it down to flexibility? Uh, that it's yes. the flexibility that that sort of transformation provides you. That it you know you don't particularly now as as you described on your team and the organizational challenges, multiple martech stacks coming together, two organizations coming together, you know increased complexity in the marketplace. That you don't necessarily know as a marketing operations professional which way your organization needs to go. So having that sort of innate foundational level of flexibility, it would. Could you, could you distill it to that or is there other aspects about it that you like the most? I think flexibility is a really core element. I also really like that many, many of these tools are designed with an ops professional in mind and not a developer in mind. And so I think this is also goes to that flexibility element. They are flexible to deploy for multiple use cases and scalable to deploy for multiple use cases across a number of tools. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay. So now flip side of the coin. Okay. Flip side of the coin. What aspect of marketing operations is absolutely de-energizing you the most right now? Is it? Oh, this is going to be a really unpopular answer. <laughs> um, and I'm aware of that, but compliance ah, okay. <laughs> in general, I think is uh, the personally the most de-energizing. As a consumer, I am all for it. <laughs> I love the, all of the privacy and compliance changes. And you know, as a professional, I also very much resonate with them. I think it is important to communicate with people the way they wanna be communicated with and respect all of that. That's just a really ever-changing space and ensuring you're staying up to date with all of the regulations can be um, challenging. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but often asked to um, be a little legal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely that aspect of it and particularly, you know, crossing borders, uh, you know, in terms of multiple countries, multilingual, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors to uh, to worry about. Um, so, uh, well, I, I appreciate the candor and I would imagine that that I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, likely feel the same way that it's. Um, you know, it, it's this blend, particularly in B2B space where, you know, our B2C experiences influence our B2B, uh, you know, work lives. And, uh, you know, so we have expectations about how we use a mobile device or how an e-commerce website should work. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we need to bring that into the same day-to-day -day work lives uh, as well. And so, you know, compliance, um, you know, is a, is an important component. So uh, I appreciate the candor. <laughs> I think you, you raised a really excellent point in that, you know, all of us who market to B2B and, you know, even make or influence purchases on the B2B side also spend a lot of our lives as B2C consumers where we are, you know, it's a more transactional uh, experience. But I think 
there's been a lot more blending of that in the last couple of years and B2B brands are starting to really uh, learn from and be influenced by a lot of changes in the B2C space. And I think that's um, a big, another big shift we're seeing a bunch. Yeah, I would agree. And, uh, and, and I know that one of the areas that certainly consumers are used to, uh, and that I think is becoming more and more prominent in the B2B space is automation. Um, and, uh, now consumers might not necessarily know that it's considered automation. They just feel it's so automated. I get an order confirmation email. I get, you know, uh, the email or a text message when my package arrives, et cetera. But all of this is, is automated. So from your own experiences with marketing operations, how are you incorporating automation into your efforts today? Oh, I think in the B2B space, so much of the B2B space is moving in the automation direction. We automate a number of the core touch points um, on both our prospect side of our life cycle and our customer side of our life cycle. And we automate things in our sales process and our sales funnel. In general, I think it is important to understand uh, or have a good sense of the end workflow without automation and really understand what it takes to get from point A to point B the hard way, if you will, um, and really document that before beginning to automate that process or that workflow. But once we've taken the steps to understand what that looks like internally, we certainly approach the, could this be better <laughs> if it were automated or is there a more efficient way to approach this? And and that's kind of how we look at leveraging or incorporating automation um, in our marketing ops process right now. Yeah, because I think that um, making a process, you know, faster, uh, you know, if, if there's a sense that that is making it more efficient, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's more efficient. It might just be making an inefficient process faster, um, as opposed to truly transforming a process, which might cut out, you know, 50% of the weight, uh, you know, uh, the time weight or delay or friction, what, however you're defining that process. Um, you might be able to, through automation, remove a lot of that so you get almost an exponential benefit that you're making it faster and you're making it more efficient. So it's it's interesting how you described that in terms of, you know, understand what you're trying to do today the hard way. I like how you phrase that, almost the hard way, the non-automated way, and then determine is that the right process and how can technology be applied to it to make it not only more efficient, but, you know, potentially more, you know, more quick or faster? Yeah, I think you raise a good point, too, that automation ideally solves both of those, right? It makes it more effective and more efficient. Um, but there are certainly times where a lightweight automation can only solve, is a quick win that can solve one of those. And that's certainly also a really good avenue to pursue as you're working towards maybe we don't have what we need to improve both of those but if we can spend some time and significantly improve one of those that's that can be a win but you only know that it's a win if you know what the end goal is and what the hard way is and what you're actually improving with that yeah, automation. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. It's almost like you don't know it until you see it. And uh, and because you've lived through the, the, the hard way or the non-automated way, you're not necessarily going to have the realization that did this actually make things better or not? <laughs> so that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> now, Jessica, before we wrap up today's episode, what is the main takeaway you want to leave our audience with in understanding the challenges facing marketing operations executives today? I think the, the core takeaway that I want to leave uh, people with at the end is automation and scale are incredibly important and are changing the way, you know, businesses and marketing teams operate and function. Um, but kind of going back to a couple of answers that I've touched on already at this point, if the foundation of the house is shaky, um, automation isn't going to improve that. So make sure that the team has 
a firm grasp on the basics and the team could be any number of people at this point, but make sure that you're correctly doing the core elements of, you know, your marketing process before you look at layering or fully layering automation into the equation. Um, and if you are solid in the fundamentals, well done automation only gives you the power to scale exponentially. But if your fundamentals are shaky, well done automation or poorly done automation or even well done automation is just going to take a magnifying glass to the shaky fundamentals and the shaky foundation that everything is. Uh -huh. Spoken from experience. That's wonderful. Well, this wraps up this episode of the Art of Marketing Operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jessica. And until next time, stay safe, take care, and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Art of Marketing Operations, brought to you by Taylor. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and share. Until next time.